Okay. <laughs> Holy shit, that is so hot. Hi, welcome Storm Chasers, and thank you for joining me here for episode two of Emo Hot Ones. I'm Corey. I'm being joined today here by Evan Weiss, founder of Storm Chasers. Oh. You may know him, but uh, you may not, so we're going to get to know him a little bit better today. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to shout out 2112 Chicago, Rob, Scott, and everybody over here for hosting us, allowing us to use this amazing studio once again. It's an honor to be here, uh, as well as everyone behind the scenes. That's Maj, Adam Beck, and of course, Eric Chaya, the saucier. He touched each of these wings. With his hands. With his hands. <laughs> uh, even though I brought gloves, uh, you know, he's vaccinated, so we're good, I think. Yeah, we're all all right. <laughs> um, in any case, so uh, Evan, uh, you've seen the first episode. I've watched it. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to help curate it, and what's interesting with this episode is there are a lot of new things on the table which I have not seen or tried yet. So um, I know I mentioned to you before we started that I'm, I'm nervous. And uh, rightfully, rightfully so. so. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's something to be said about getting interviewed by your friends. It's a little, maybe a little more terrifying than being interviewed by a stranger. So, all right, well, let's fucking do it. Let's get into it. <laughs> um, the first sauce today on uh, on the menu is Tapatio. Classic. Classic. One of my favorites. I have uh, a couple bottles at least around the apartment all the time. So. We have one at Type One too. It's just been sitting there for years. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, let's kick it off. So, uh, I kicked off the Rat Boys episode this way. I'm sure you've been asked this a lot through the years, but um, what does the name Intuit Over It mean, and uh, what does it mean to you? Well, um, the way that the project Intuit Over It initially started was a 52-week um, songwriting project. And so, uh, a brief explanation of that was that we had one week to write, record, and release a song every week for an entire year. and. The name Into It Over It came from the idea of just being, you're into something, and then you immediately have to shift gears, you're over it, and then you immediately have to start being into something else. Yep. Um, so that's where the band name initially came from, and it wasn't even a band name, it was just a name for that project. It okay. wasn't supposed to go beyond 52 weeks at all. And so when, um, when it came time to eventually start focusing on solo material again, this was, you know, two years later, after 52 weeks had started, and at this point, there was a CD version of 52 Weeks that existed, and it just made sense for me to keep the name rather than try to like start the project over with a brand new name. It's like we already have something that we could that is tangible that we 52 could sell. songs to choose from yeah, for a so, set. So you know, it just kind of made sense to roll with the name that way. I don't think if I were going to have started the project fresh with a different background that that would have been the name. But you're stuck some, with it. Now. Yeah, sometimes that's just like the natural way that things happen. It's kind of something that you don't plan for or expect, but it just becomes. Uh, what feels right and what feels good. And so when I look back on it now, whenever I see the name, whenever I think about the name and took over it, I'm, I'm always reminded of the humble beginnings of the project and, and kind of where it came from. And I think that still applies now to how we write music and how quickly we move and how each record sounds different than the one before it and how I'm constantly trying to uh, focus on how we can make the project evolve and just seem fresh and new every single time we do something. Awesome. Well, there's definitely a common thread from, uh, you know, 52 weeks to, uh, you know, current into it over it, um, you know, music. So, uh, but it's definitely fresh and new each time. So that makes sense. And I think it speaks to the nature of the name and, uh, and the origin of the band. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, great. Well, uh, here we are. Wing number two. Uh, this is here. Mezcal June Can by uh, bottle, Lady Shiraz Sauces. Hot. I mean, literally. And figuratively. <laughs> well, well, we're about to find out. And creatively, I guess. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Wing two. Wing two. All right. So uh, for the second question, um, from the humble beginnings where this was your solo project with, uh, you know, some various other contributors to uh, various lineup changes to where you're at now in 2021, um, give me the top five bands that represent Intuit Over It in 2021. What bands 
Like influences? In, in influences, or would you just say encompass the general vibe of Intuit over it in its current lineup? Oof. Um, well, are, we, are we thinking sonically? Are we thinking, I guess, just overall, just anything, right? Yep. So, um, in 2021, I think the, uh, I think a big one that wasn't part of the foundation of the band initially when it had started, but it's, it feels more applicable now, is a band like Fugazi, which um, is a band that's very self-made. Uh, it's one that is very hardworking and driven to do things their way and on their own, which is kind of what Intuit Over It has evolved into now, which we're in like this unique position where we're able to run this record label and do things ourselves and be able to you know, kind of create stuff on our own terms. Um, so that feels really applicable. Uh, Sonically, um, I've been really vibing this band Mice Parade for the last couple of years, and I've been really influenced to, um, you know, essentially the way that they Mice Parade writes their songs is that they create music that sounds and feels electronic, but it's with all analog instruments. They're not doing anything that's necessarily uh, electronically driven, and um, and that's always something that I think me and Adam and Joe and Matt really try to push ourselves to do is create electronic or or interesting sounds out of very, uh, you know, just acoustic instruments in general. Adam's really great at that, especially with the drumming. Um, man, five bands. Give me, me three. Give me three. Give me with three. Give me one more to round it out. Um, I'm just going to say Pearl Jam because they're my favorite band of all time. All right. <laughs> Hell yeah. I think, and I actually think Pearl Jam does something that I really appreciate. They're, they're really good to their fans. They're very uh, giving to their fans. I love the idea that they, every single time you see them perform, you get something different. Um, they're very good about curating their set lists and not offering up the same thing twice. I think that's moving forward as we get into 2021 and 2022. Um, I want to make sure if Intuit Over it's a touring act that uh, that you could go and see five shows and not see the same thing five times. You know? Awesome. I don't want it, I don't want there to be the same banter. I don't want there to be the same set list. I want it to be something that's a different, unique experience based on every single show. While at the same time being very supportive of the people that are supportive of us. So like with the Patreon. What we're able to do is just really give back in a lot of really interesting ways, and, um, you know. And then you know, something like this is, is a great example of it. It's like something so small; it's just a tiny gesture, but it's like it really means a lot. You know? Yeah. Um, I know if my favorite band was doing something like that, I'd be pumped. So. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, well, five. Yeah, yeah. Three. Sunday, three. Sunday Real Estate and Mock Orange. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. I was expecting at least one of those. Those, to are, pop those up. are both there. You know, yeah. Mock Orange is so good at guitar. How would you not want to be as good at guitar as they are? They're like, still killing it. Killing it. Every yeah. like they, I, you listen to those records. It's like the greatest guitar shit you've ever heard in your life. Check out Mock Orange. Why well, get those records? So good. All right. Uh, here we're off and on to number and three. Uh, this is Marty and Joe's uh, Green Hot Sauce. I forget the name. Sorry, Joe. What's the um, bottle? What is the bottle? Oh, it, there's no uh, no label on it. But it's their only Green Hot Sauce. GB's Smoky oh, Serrano Sensation. Oh, it's GB's Smoky <laughs> Serrano Sensation. All right, there we Can go. Can you zoom in on that, Maj? <laughs> he cannot. Uh, <laughs> GB's Smoky Gnarly smoky, smoky sensation. Smoky Serrano, but it's with sixes. So it's 666, which is great. I actually have the Roman numeral 666 tattooed on my wrist. Ah, interesting. So I don't know what that means, but... We may find out. Well, we're gonna find out after I eat this sauce. Yeah, all right, so wing number three, going in, going Marty help. and Joe's hot sauce, the green. <laughs> so, uh, for question number three, it's kind of a two-parter. Um, when you were writing 12 Towns, uh, I'm sure that you never imagined you'd be playing those songs quite literally around the world. Um, so um, where's some place that you've never played that you always have wanted to and hope to someday? Oh, wow, great question. Um, I really want to play in South Korea. Awesome. I, I want to do a show in Seoul very, very badly. That, um, you know, we've done a lot of tours to Japan and Seoul has always kind of seemed like the next step in that in that travel path, you know, like I've been to Australia. I want, I want to go back to Australia too, because the last time I was in Australia, I went with a broken foot. It was really not as much fun as it, I think it should have been, but um, I've always wanted to go to Seoul. I've never played in South America. Okay. That'd be another place that, you know, like we've had friends, like Dowsing has gone to Brazil and, and friends who have played in Mexico. And it's just like, that seems like such a blast. Um, those are two places that really stick out to me. I think playing in like Iceland would be a really, really great time. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, or even just going to Iceland. I've never been to Iceland, so like I've, I just want to do that. You know, whether borrow a, show a guitar or not. and yeah. play a show randomly. And, um, 
And finally, you know, Brian Meats and I have always talked about going to Alaska. And, oh, uh, yes. Because he's played in Alaska. And I'm like, well, I, Brian plays in It's a King thing. And so he's gone to Alaska, and I've always, he, you know, he told us that he had gone, and he was just like, man, that seems so cool. Like, Absolutely. Just putzing around out there. Um, I've also had friends who've, like, talked to me about other crazy places that they've played, and I remember specifically on a, on a tour, I was speaking with this person, Franz Nikolai, and Franz Nikolai was telling me how they would take trains through, like, Western Russia and just pop off in these small towns and play these shows, and... And we had talked about it for a little bit, and that to me just seemed like scary and insane, but also like incredible. You know, what an amazing life experience. So funny um, enough, Joe from Marty and Joe's Hot Sauce, his band Elway played in the Red Square in Moscow. Yeah, and, and that, it sounds, that seems nuts to me. Yeah. You know, like I, I don't know. I think the days of me doing like those sorts of aggressive, like if I'm gonna go on a train and and go through Western Russia, I'm just gonna go on a train and go through Western Russia. I'm not gonna bring my guitar. But it's yeah. like. You know, but the, the 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 days of me doing that kind of like aggressive, crazy travel touring, I think are done. But like, there are certain places that I would really love to play a show, and I think um, definitely South Korea is the big one that sticks out. South Korea, South America, Evan's coming. Bring you us. heard it. Bring me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, bring us. <laughs> uh, for part two of that question, um, uh, if you could live in any of the twelve towns on the uh, the aforementioned records, what? town would you not want to move oh. to? Oh. <laughs> um, what town would I not? I'm trying to think what all the towns are now. Um, probably the South Carolina one. What is the town, the South Carolina town? I try not to think about that town very often. It's a very sad story. But I mean, the other one's like, I would totally live in DC. I would totally live in Buffalo, New York. Um, I would live in Billings. I would live in Portland. Um, oh, you know what? Brenham, Texas. I wouldn't move. I wouldn't go to Brenham, Texas. Okay. I had a great time in Brenham, Texas. I don't. I would definitely not live there. All right. We'll leave it at that. We'll leave that for another podcast or interview. <laughs> Why wouldn't you go to Brenham? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. Okay. Uh, well, all right. That was probably what I was imagining to be the most difficult question because, you know, you never want to have to talk bad about it. Yeah, I mean, well, you, that, that's the thing. So the, the experience of Brenham was so much fun, but, but it, you know, it's that's what's so interesting about those towns is, like, those stories are all about set and setting, and they're very little to do with the actual town themselves. Right. You know, it's... A specific um, moment. Yeah, yeah. And, and, like, those... Like, I have... There are so many people who I'm sure talk shit on a place like Buffalo, New York. And it's like, I've had nothing but incredible experiences in Buffalo, New York, because I know incredible people in Buffalo, New York. And the so, Patreon like, has talked shit on Akron, Ohio for some and reason. And Akron, Ohio is incredible. <laughs> I would like, that's like one of five cities I would move to. But I think yeah. the reason I love Akron, Ohio, the reason I love Buffalo, New York is not the city itself so much as the people that are in it. It's Absolutely. Like, and that's what I think really makes uh, a place living um, worthwhile. You know, yeah. it's like who you know and and how you're able to enjoy your time there, not necessarily the city itself. Awesome. Well said. All right, you ready for uh, wing God number dead? five? Is God dead? This is God is dead sauces <laughs> out of Philly. This is new to the lineup. Um, thank you, Rick, for coordinating this. Um, this is the jalapeno popper sauce. Uh, we'll be trying it for the first time together here. I'm starting to sweat. Yeah, it's getting a little spicy. It might here. be because the AC's not working. It may be. <laughs> A fantastic. It might day also for be it. because I'm wearing a bandana and a fucking sweater. Yeah, I was wondering. <laughs> Yesterday full shorts, but today full flannel. So let's go. All right, here we go. And the sauces so far have not been. They're they're hot, and it's actually it's funny. Like I'm you know thinking about it like. You're curious, like how difficult it would be to answer. Like, I'm, this is—it's such a unique experience, right? It's like it's kind of like doing drugs. Like, you don't know what the drug's gonna do until you're in the middle of being high. But like, <laughs> and I'm sorry, I misspoke. This is number four. This is not number five. I almost skipped ahead in my questions here. Um, so, for uh, for number four, you have a very extensive collection of gear, from guitars to basses to pedals to amps <laughs> and keyboards. <laughs> and drum kits. Um, I don't even drum. <laughs> doesn't even drum. Um, that said, uh, what is uh, your biggest songwriting tool that influences your songwriting style? Oh my goodness. And because of the extensive nature of this project, of this band, you can go ahead and think about it as, say, 2008 or and also 2021. Just a specific piece of gear? 
or like an instrument. Something you, it could be a concept, it could be gear, it could be a, a way of thinking, a way of productivity, uh, a songwriting tool that you always need to have. Oh, well, it's a guitar. I mean, without a doubt. And, and you know, and I've tried really hard to, to, uh, I've tried really hard to, to stray from guitar. And not in a way that is, um, not because I don't love it, because I do. And it's, it's like the instrument that I feel most comfortable with. Uh, that and bass, like I feel really comfortable with bass, but I never write songs on bass. Um, that's, that's also not true. I write songs on bass for pet symmetry, of course. but when I'm writing into it over material, I'm, uh, you know, it's always, it always, the foundation is always generally on a guitar. Um, but you know, I've been trying to figure out ways to develop ideas on a guitar, or a melody on a guitar, and then be able to begin translating that to other sounds because I'm not so interested in always every foundation once it's recorded or presented being that guitar idea. Right. Um, I'm also not really interested in traditionally good sounding guitar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Adam and I have this phrase, which you know he actually coined to me, which was, um, "If you can't make a good choice, make an interesting." And there you go. That really stuck with me. That's like a, a huge, really resonated with me. And it was already, and it was just a way of articulating something that I was already feeling and thinking, but hadn't had the way to like voice that. Yeah. And um, and those to me are always my favorite songs. When you can hear a song and be like, "What the fuck is that?" That yeah. is like just such a interesting listening experience and something that's way cooler to me than just like good sounding guitar. Like there there's fucking decades of good sounding traditional guitar. Yeah. I don't need to make that. I don't, what am I going to do to contribute to that, you know? But the backbone, essentially, would be write it first, Always. sitting down with a guitar, and then maybe translate that to something yeah. else. And, you know, and sometimes the, you know, there, are, there are recordings we've done that start that way and then don't even have guitar on them at all. And what's, um, what's been really interesting this year specifically is Adam and I starting this band with our friend Tanner called Couplet. And those songs being Tanner presenting us with a demo and Adam and I being able to just completely dismantle those songs and recreate them in a new way. But I went into that project specifically thinking like, I'm not going to play guitar at all. Yep. Um, and more so, and, we, and I did, there is me playing guitar on, those, on the songs that we've made, but the foundation of it was like, what can I do that would feel, like what kind of ideas could I bring to the table that wouldn't just be me falling back into my comfort zone of mm -hmm. guitar? Like if I'm approaching an instru instrument I'm not super comfortable with, then that'll produce ideas that are maybe a little more unique or weird yeah. because I don't know what I'm doing. There you go. And so I think that kind of keeps it a little fresh for me, keeps it fun for me, but... Um, keeps yeah, it I mean, interesting. Absolutely, yeah. But traditionally speaking, guitar guitar is the foundation for 97.5% of everything that I've probably ever written. Awesome. Well, I'm very much looking forward to that project. Uh, I've heard bits here and there, but I'm excited for that to be available for the masses. Coming so. soon. 2021. <laughs> All right. A lot in 2021. Okay, uh, I misspoke earlier about being on to question number five, wing number five, but now we are finally here. It's about time. Uh, and we are uh, <laughs> on to one of my favorites of the lineup here. This is Harbinger uh, by Soothsayer. Um, our, um, our signature sauce is by Soothsayer here in Chicago. Uh, Kyle was kind enough to uh, to make that happen for us and very quickly, nonetheless, make it available to all of our patrons. So, um, you know, we had to include uh, my other favorite here, which is the Harbinger sauce found in uh, various restaurants across Chicago. Uh, let's dive in. I actually forget what the Harbinger is. I've had it before, but... <laughs> Um, so, for question number five, what is your biggest uh, non-musical accomplishment and why is it Midnight Marauders? <laughs> uh, no, shout out Midnight Marauders, we're going on one of those rides after this, so it was fresh on the brain, but uh, what, in, in actuality, what is your greatest personal non-musical accomplishment? Well, Midnight Marauders is actually a really special accomplishment. I, I, I'll answer this question truthfully okay. after, after this, but it, you know, the fact that we were able to do something last year that really, I think, helped a lot of us cope with um, what was happening during the pandemic was really, really special. And essentially just having a way where we could safely see each other every week and catch up on our week. Essentially, we would do these bike rides every Friday around 10 p.m. And it was a really nice way to keep all of us connected during a really difficult time. And, um, so the fact that A, we were able to do that all through the summer last year, and the fact that B, enough people loved doing it that we're able to start doing it again this year. Season as two. To like, you know, the city of Chicago as of today is publicly open, and we're electing to go on a bike ride instead of go to the bar. And that to me is like, really means a lot that that Absolutely. was something that we were able to create. It helped me get through it a lot, so that's why I brought it up, but. Yeah, yeah you know, and same, you know. So, greatest personal non-musical accomplishment. Um, 
I was a per, well, um, I mean, I guess it's sort of still musical, but I was, uh, and I don't even know if this is like necessarily the greatest one. I may need more time to think about that, but one that's really fresh on my memory mm -hmm. is being able to be a co-producer on the Pedal movie, which was a full-length feature film that we produced through my job. I work at a company called Reverb. Um, I was able to be a producer on that film. Um, you know, what was like a two or three year long project of collecting interviews and content and building products and launching a shop and, you know, putting together all of this work, you know, to be a, a cog in that and, and one that was like, a, a felt like a pretty important one where I was like conducting interviews with brands and actually like setting up these product launches to help support the movie. And um, that to me was a really, really special moment where, you know, when like Ultimate Guitar says, that the product you have made is the number one gear story of the year. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, like growing up reading Ultimate Guitar. Yeah, it's like a thing that I invented in my head and was able to take to my friends and, you know, not not the products themselves, but like the idea of being like, what if we did this? Yeah. And then be able to take that to some friends and be like, what if we did this? And then to do it. And then for that to be, like for all the gear releases that come out in the year 2020, mm -hmm. for that to be the story yeah. is like, that felt really awesome to me. And Absolutely. Like, and no one knows that, you know, it's not a thing that is like, you know, I don't, I don't, that's not like a thing I get like a trophy for or anything, but it's like, it's something that I know and that, and it's really a personal accomplishment. Yeah. So, uh, where can everyone find that online? Um, well, the pedal movie is available through Reverb. I mean, I think it's just reverb.com slash the pedal movie. Um, I also, if you just go to iTunes or Voodoo or any of the, you know, kind of like online streaming services yeah. and search the pedal movie, you can see it. Um, and there are still pedals, like actual tangible products that we made that go along with the movie as well that are available on Reverb. Um, and then other products that you can find on the used market now for maybe double or triple what they okay. were when we actually sold them. But you know, like that was a really special accomplishment to me. I'd never been involved in a full-length feature film before, and then to, like see my name in credits was like actually like a pretty cool feeling. I, Absolutely, it was. You know, you don't realize that kind of thing is super cool until you're like in it. Um, yeah. I had a friend recently asked me like what they they asked me what they thought my purpose, like what is what is your reason for being. Oh wow. Which is a heavy question. Yeah, that's very. But and but I had an answer. And okay. I, I felt like my my reason for being here like on on earth, you know, like whatever, my reason for existing and something that I think is like a talent that I really pride myself on is being able to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And like if I know one person who I think would be really a really excellent collaborative partner with another person, I want to get them in the same room and get them working on something. If yep. I have an idea where it's like I have this collaborative idea, I want to collect these people to do it. I feel like I'm, I have a talent for being able to arrange, align, and then execute. Yeah. And um, that's something I've carried with me and refined through my teens and my 20s and now into my 30s. And I think Storm Chasers is also a really great example of that. Um, and it's just something that I love to do. I love yeah. to be able to take, you know, harebrained ideas and turn them into a reality. Well, from Midnight Marauders to Storm Chasers, uh, it's brought a lot of, uh, you know, enjoyment in my life in uh, what was a dark time for everybody last year and, and continues to be for, for some. Um, but yeah, bringing people together, you really can't tout any other accomplishment higher than that, I think. Yeah, that so. may be the, the, the global accomplishment. Yeah. It's like the ability to bring people together. Absolutely, awesome. <laughs> um, so we'll dive into uh, the back half of the selection <gasps> here, <laughs> which is wing number six. Oh, uh, no. This is also a store-bought find. Uh, this is El Yucateco's, uh, let's see, Caribbean habanero. So we're into the habanero line. Oof. Uh, moving I'm, on up. I'm spooked. I, All right. this, is, this, is where I, this is where I'm like, the first six, I feel like, is the warm-up, and already I'm like sweaty, you know. All right, well, let's uh, let's get after number six here. Okay, so for for this uh, this question, we're gonna go ahead and bring back a photo from uh, your past, but also mine. You know, before you even turn the computer screen, I know exactly which photo. It is. I know so you do. Let me see if I can let me see if I can guess it before you even turn the screen. This is me, you. Zach from Glockamora, Nate, and we're in the basement of It's a Clink Thing in Akron. We're watching Glockamora play. Um, you got it. All right, so <laughs> tell me, tell me. Beans uh, in the photo too. Yep, tell me about okay. this day, uh, about this show, about this tour, uh, um, maybe what your set was that night, if you can remember that far back. Well, so we played a cling. Historically, if I was gonna play a cling thing, I would play in the living room. Um, this tour was immediately following a European tour I had done with Grown Ups in 2010, I think. 
Um, I had to keep touring because I had found out that I had lost my job like oh. about two weeks before I'd returned to the United States. So like, I basically told my job that I was, I was going to Europe no matter what. Mm. Like, I have this opportunity to go to a European tour. I'm, I may never get to go to Europe ever again. With grown-ups, no less? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, but that didn't matter. Like, I couldn't tell them. You know, it would matter for me, but right. anyways. But, so, but it's like, either way, I'm looking at it like, seven weeks in Europe, I get to go to all these fucking countries. I may never get this opportunity ever again. I gotta go. Yeah. So I went to my job and was like, I'm going on this trip. If you need to let me go, I completely understand, but I'm going on this trip no matter what. Yeah. And I was told, it's cool, go on the trip. And when you come back, let us know. We'll have we'll have your job for you. So about a week or two before I was about to come home, hit him up and was like, "Hey, I'm gonna be back in a couple of weeks. Like, when can I start?" And they're like, "Oh, actually, your position has been filled." <laughs> wow. Okay. So I got home and I had realized like, "Oh, I have to keep touring." Yeah. Because if I don't keep touring, I'm I'm gonna be fucking broke. Yeah. So at the time, was communicating with I don't even know who necessarily I was talking to at this time in. Guacamora or snowing, but I found out that they were doing a run and I, I kind of like asked if I could go and we kind of worked it out where if I was able to contribute a couple of shows, then I could do, you know, I could come along with the leg and just like open up. Yeah. And uh, this show specifically was after a show in Fredonia, New York uh, with the band Longitude. We had driven to Akron the next day. We'd played in Akron. The Fredonia show was exceptionally difficult. There was like nobody there and it was a, a emotional night. I remember Twister being on the television all night long also, which was actually Shout pretty funny that we're, that we're doing a Storm Chasers thing right now. But the Akron show was was really, really excellent. I mean, it was we knew going into that trip that Kling thing would always be a really reliable, good time for everybody involved. Um, all those bands, including Intuit Over It, came through Kling so many times. Probably countless times. Uh, this lineup in particular was uh, one that stands out to me in terms of uh, all the shows that have continued to go on. There, what was so. really funny about this day specifically, it was actually not so much this show, but the next day, okay. where we had uh, we were going to go play in Louisville with Xerxes. And so we had, it was either Xerxes or Mountain Sleep, but we were going to go play a show in Louisville that they had set up. And so we were driving from Akron to Louisville, Kentucky, and we decided to take, there's like that fork where you can either choose to take like 65 or 79 or whatever those highways are. Mm -hmm. And we decided to take one and not the other. And eventually we get to a certain point and it's just bumper to bumper traffic and like standstill like parking lot traffic. Yeah. And so um, me and, and you know, now they go by the name Willow, but me and Willow had gotten out of the car and started playing catch in the, on the side of the, we brought our baseball gloves and we're like playing catch on the side of the street. And, and um, we're just kind of sitting out there for hours. Yeah. Like, like it's, we, I think we got stuck in traffic at two. It eventually started getting dark at like eight. Oh, wow. And we're like, we're not moving at all. Yeah. And eventually cars are just starting to peel off and turn around. So, and at this point we'd waited in traffic so long, we'd completely missed the show. Yeah. And we're like, well, fuck it. And the next day was supposed to be Chicago. So we just, we like go down the embankment in my Dodge Intrepid. I'm like driving down into the embankment and I have like Galm and Nate in the car and we hightail it back to Chicago that night. Turns out on the highway, just ahead, like another few miles, a molasses truck had crashed and spilled molasses across both lanes what? of the highway. So cars couldn't go because it was covered in fucking like truck shit and molasses. Midday sun yeah. and, oh my God. <laughs> Which so like the moving like molasses jokes were relentless of for course. like a week. But like that was just the luck that, I mean that tour was surrounded with a bunch of like some, actually like two of maybe the worst shows, Into Whatever shows I'd ever played in my life were on that tour. Okay. And so there was just so much good luck and bad luck surrounding that initial trip. And, um, but the memories that I have from it are all, are all incredibly positive. And I, I wonder, I'd be actually really curious what the, <laughs> how the rest of them remember that adventure. I would, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe that could be a little extra podcast that we can maybe coordinate at some point soon. But uh, yeah, that show was but, a I mean, standout yeah. for me and I'm look sure that tour was a standout look. for you. I know. I mean, come on. Drinking a PBR there. Yeah, what? <laughs> awesome. Speaking of beer. Yeah, I'm gonna re-up uh, as well. <laughs> All right, we're on Marie to number Sharp. seven, Marie Sharps. This is another store-bought. Uh, it said beware really big on it, so that's Comatose why I bought heat it. heat level. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just says, it says the, the famous Marie Sharps, but I've never heard, I've oh. never heard of them. It's, uh, it's famous. It may heat, become infamous after heat this. Heat level 5X. Yeah. Okay. And it's not even the end, so. No, I know. Um, I mean, Marie Sharps, beware. This is uh, number seven. I 
feel you. I think it's I think it's pretty great. It's, it's pretty a creeper delicious. though. It is. It's creeping right now. Yeah. Um, Woo, actually. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned earlier the um, the Roman numeral of six 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 on your wrist. Yes. Six hundred and sixty six weeks ago was September fifth, two thousand eight. You were in the tail end of the 52 Weeks Project. Do you know what song you were working on that week? So, uh, it would have been, um, I think it might have been Wearing White. Uh, because that would have been right near the tail end. Well, I, lucky for you, I did my research. And in fact, uh, it was Young Lungs. Oh. That came out on September 7th, two days later on that Sunday. Okay. Um, Wearing White's either right before it or right after it. Um, yeah, and then it's and then it's uh, rapid shitty South Dakota, and then uh, no big chorus. The last two. Well, young lung specifically, um, uh, at least lyrically, seems to be about either your decision to move to Chicago or the finalization of that. So, um, what influenced you to want to move to Chicago? Wow, great question. Um, so, when I was 18 years old, I was playing in a band. Uh, I was playing in a band with my buddy Shane McCauley, this dude Jeff Fervazio. The band was called Liars and Magicians, and I answered an ad on the internet to play upright bass in a band. And Love it was, it. and it kind of had like a, um, had like an indie rock kind of like arts and crafts, like the label arts and crafts kind of feel to it. Um, just these kind of like really like lo-fi, cool indie. I wouldn't even call it emo. I don't think it really was. Um, there's actually a song specifically that I've always wanted to cover and never have. It was called 10,000 Black Sparrows. I always thought that was a really amazing song. I've always wanted to do an Into Dover version of that. So I was playing in this band and we would play shows. We would open shows at the Kyber and we actually opened for like Minus the Bear and Joan of Arc. We got to play Stars. We got to open these like wow. really cool shows. Um, and uh, because Shane, who was um, the guitar player in that band, was a photographer for a lot of prominent records at that time. Like he had shot the cover. There's a really specific record cover you may know that's, um, it's a Kid Dynamite compilation. Okay. And they're all wearing football helmets like the Who cover. Mm -hmm. And it says punk on the football helmets. He shot that cover. And it's and oh, wow. in those helmets is this, is Sean Agnew, this dude Brian, um, you know, a couple other people. And so Shane was uh, planning a tr road trip to Chicago to see some friends. And mm -hmm. so he had, had invited me to go on this road trip with him. Mm -hmm. And the road trip wound up being me, him, Sean Agnew from R5, and this dude Clint. And so we drove out to Chicago like in a single day, and uh, it was my very first time going. And I was this 18-year-old kid, and yeah. he invited me because he knew that I had this huge attachment to Chicago music and like this. I'm just and I'm all it's all imaginary, you know. Like I don't know what it's like here. Yeah. But like, was 18 and was like all my favorite bands are from there. Like you know, it's romanticized in your totally. mind. Yeah. So he brings me on this trip and I come out to Chicago and uh, I have this amazing weekend and I make really good friends with Shane's friends who we were there to visit. And um, during the course of the trip, the dude Brian, who's actually on that Kid Dynamite record cover, he asked if, uh, he was curious about finding someone to sublet an apartment for him while he was going to be going on a trip that summer. Mm -hmm. So I was young and just out of high school and wasn't going to be going to college. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll sublet. Mm -hmm. So I saved up all summer and I got the money together and um, sublet his apartment from like August 2003 through like December 2003. At the age of 18? 18. 18. Wow, okay. And so, and I was broke. Like mm -hmm. I didn't get a job while I was here. It was just like the kind of thing where I'd saved up all this money, had just enough to like barely get by. So I was like making like spaghetti every night. Yeah. Like, you know, but the apartment was actually a couple blocks from where I live now. It's on California and Armitage, right in the middle of Logan Square. And this is Logan Square in 2003, so it's a lot different than what Logan Square looks like now. Um, the only thing that I could do as a 18-year-old was go to the Fireside Bowl. Okay. Or hang out with my friends at their apartment. Another one of those romanticized venues, though. Right, but the, yeah. but the Fireside was only like a mile up the road. Right. So And the shows were all five bucks at that time, so I would just go to the Fireside all the time. And so that was what my fall of 2003 was, like me, like, hanging out in my friend Andrea's apartment and going to the Fireside Bowl. To see and, Braid and, uh, you know, well, so, all the classics. And Chicago, so, the, but the real unique experience of all of that is uh, our friends up, up, down, down were passing through Chicago. And so awesome. they played at the Fireside and they were like, oh, we're going on this tour. We're on this tour. We're passing through Chicago, but then we're like looping around the Midwest and then coming back through Chicago. Do you want to ride with us for a couple of days? Yeah. I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I jump in the van with them and we ride around to a couple shows and the third show 
is in Woodstock, Illinois, which is a suburb of where we are right now. The person who promoted that show, which I didn't know at the time, was Marky from the Felix Culpa. Okay. And the other band that had played with Up Up Down Down was this band Monday's Hero, which is uh, Tim uh, ran a record label with Jay. Tim wound up being the bass player and into it over it years and years later. Okay. But so I, we're at this show. Yeah. Monday's Hero covers Braid at the show. And I'm standing behind the merch table and they come back to the merch and I was like, dude, I fucking love Braid. Like, I, know, I don't know anybody that would like cover that band. Like, yeah. I play in this band, The Progress, that would like, you know, that's like what we're all about, you know? Yeah. So we made friends at this random show that I was at and then they became the people that like, whenever The Progress was rolling through, we mm -hmm. would play our shows with the Felix Culpo, we would play our shows with Monday's Hero, we became really good friends with all of them. And then I just started coming out here like every, like two weekends a month just to hang out. And so eventually I got a really good job in New Jersey and that was kind of what was holding me up from moving mm. out here. But the plan was always like, I'm going to end up in Chicago. Yeah. And, uh, and then right at the, like at the beginning of 2008 when 52 weeks started, I kind of made this promise to myself. It was just like, at the end of this year, I'm going to, like when this project is over, I'm moving to Chicago. Yeah. And, um, and even I, I joined Demira, this band Demira in the middle of that and even told them at the time, like I'm moving to Chicago at this time. So like, if you want me to play in this band, like the band would need to go. And they all came, which was crazy that they agreed to do it. But I think they were also really excited about the idea of going to a new major city. So, so that romanticized notion uh, definitely, you know, turned into something that, that brought you to where you're at now. Yeah, um, I mean, if it, weren't, if it weren't for the bands that I loved in my teens, I, I mean, if all of the bands in my teens existed in Portland, Oregon, I would have gone to Portland, Oregon. If they all existed in Austin, Texas, I would have gone to Austin, Texas. You know, it's just like those one shot drives would have taken a little longer. A little yeah. longer. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely done that 12 hour Philly to or New Jersey to Chicago drive mm -hmm. way more times than I'd like to admit. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I had similar romanticized notions, uh, similar, you know, um, friendly music community that brought me out here. Uh, several of those people are even in this room right now. Uh, so I definitely feel that. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I definitely feel that. Uh, and that was an excellent answer. And I had no idea that you moved here at 18. Uh, yeah, just for a little bit. But, you know, awesome. like one, the second I came back, like the second we, I went back to New Jersey, like I couldn't wait to return. And especially yeah. having like met just in like the six months that I was here, had having met people that have remained Real, I mean, not just friends, but like also like bandmates. You know, I mean, for, we had Marky on the Fifty Two Weeks podcast. Yeah, you like know, and it's like, ago. and it's like he's tattooed me. You know, it's yeah. like, but he wasn't a tattoo artist then. You know, right. he's like, you know, and so it's like, but I've known him since I was eighteen years old. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and so to think about that now at thirty seven, it's like, or thirty six, it's like in a year or so we'll have known each other for twenty years. Wild, That's fucking crazy. Absolutely. You know? Well, that's excellent insight into what brought you out here. But once again, I had no idea that. You know, that, that journey started nearly 20 years ago. So, <laughs> um, well, if you're ready, we will kick it off with wing number eight. Ooh. This is also new to the lineup. This is Evan Bernard from uh, the Super Weeks. Uh, this is Blood Boiler uh, by Weak Sauce. Weak Sauces. Sauce. And pretty cool little bat. bat. Yeah, biting yeah. into an orange, orange and some peppers. So yeah. giving us a little fangs. taste of what we're going to get into. What do we got in here? Fucking red Savina. I don't even know what that is. We're about to find out <laughs> together. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. Okay, so I know uh, it's all gonna end on the next wing, but all good. So mm. for question number eight, uh, we've got this fantastic sauce from Philly. Uh, I need you to rapid fire. Give me the top food spots in Philly, top food spots in Chicago. Go oh off the dome. Just well, um, rather than top food spots, I'm going to tell you about my top foods because I actually have been gone from Philly for so long that I don't even know what the top spots are anymore. But if I go home to Philadelphia, I need to eat a cheesesteak. All right. Which if I'm going of to course. go, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Jim's on South. It's my favorite steak. Um, there's just something it's, I mean, it's been around for as long as I've been around and if not longer and, um, it's unbelievably delicious. It's just like the perfect and uh, like embodiment of what I think a Philly cheesesteak would be. Um, I think a good slice of pizza, which New Jersey actually, where I'm actually from, has been rated the number one pizza state in the United States, which I don't know if y'all knew. I had no idea. But <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna get pizza in Jersey, I suggest fucking Vito's by Route, I'm sorry, exit 32 on 295, which that's some real fucking Jersey shit if you know your fucking 295 exit. <laughs> um, you also gotta get a Panzerati, which is at Franco's in uh, Haddonfield. 
which is a thing that you can only get in New Jersey. And basically what a panzerotti is, is a, um, it's essentially like a calzone, but it's like a deep fried calzone. Um, it's unique to that area of the world. You can't find them anywhere else, and there's only two places in South Jersey that actually make them. There's Franco's in Haddonfield, and then another place in like Marlton, but Franco's is the original. That's absolutely like what was the OG Panzerati. Um, I'm waiting for Brian Meats to bring me one when he comes out. They're, at, they're the most fucking incredible thing you've ever had. So Panzerati, good slice pizza, cheesesteak. Those are the three things. And, and straight up, I have not yet found like really amazing this isn't to say that Italian food in Chicago is not amazing because I've had good Italian food here, but Italian food in Jersey and Philadelphia is better. I'm sorry, it just is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's better, there's other, you know, regional Chicago cuisine that's better here than, and not, like I didn't have my our first real taco until I lived in Chicago, Illinois. Hard um, agree on that one, yes. But um, if I was gonna say best food in Chicago, uh, I actually think Pequod's Pizza is probably one of my favorite things. And it's not a thing you can get all, all the time. It's kind of a thing I usually only get when I have guests from out of town. Um, but it's that, a lot. <laughs> that's the number one. Um, I really love El Patron, which is our, our taco spot in Logan Square. It's just fucking delicious. It's like a regular a regular staple in our takeout ordering. Um, but we also, Chicago is such an excellent food city. I mean, we're only one of three cities in the United States that has the Michelin star system. And so the fact that um, you know, it's like New York, Philadelphia, and or I'm sorry, New York, Chicago, and what, like Seattle. You know, it's like not even LA. So like the fact that, I, and that might be the wings talking, I could be wrong, but that's, <laughs> I'm fucking fired up right now. But the fact that Chicago has so many good restaurants, it's just, uh, the food scene here is just absolutely unbelievable. And it'd be really hard to just pick one really great restaurant. I mean, Pet Symmetry got to go to Alinea, and that's just like one of the, I'll remember that meal for the rest of my life. But like, that's not something you can eat all the time. That's not something you would like suggest to your friends when they come into the city that they could get. That's like such a specific. It's no um, Panzerati. Right, yeah. you know? And so, on, but like, you know, straight up, like if you want like the real insider tip, like the super deep cut shit, the Home Depot on Elston Avenue, <laughs> if you want to get the greatest <laughs> fucking Chicago hot dog of your life, that's it, my friend. <laughs> our, uh, our limited studio audience here is a resounding yes on that one. That is the real deal shit. All right, you heard it, Home Depot dog. Don't forget it. Now, I've heard that each Home Depot has their own regional cuisine, uh, so. <laughs> well, like across the nation? No, I, I, I'm serious. Uh, I actually so, have no idea, is that yeah. true? Like if I go to the one in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, am I gonna get like I don't whole know if they have a Panzerati suit? there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, all right. Are you ready for wing number nine? Oh God. No, I'm not. That, fuck, this shit is hot. It's great. Man, it my, blood, my blood is boiling. Yeah, you're getting a little silly, I, I can see it. It's but, too, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you gotta hold it together. You're a professional, but I'm, you know, we're all just having fun here. All right, you ready for nine? Whew. <laughs> this one will cheers. You wanna cheers on the we're bomb? Gonna, we're gonna cheers on the bomb in solidarity. <laughs> oh, God. Come on. I've had the bomb before, too. Have you, have you, all, you had the bomb at home? Man. <laughs> Email us your answers. Yeah. Tell us what you think of the bomb. I think I have emo hot ones at Gmail. I'm not wow. sure. Wow. <laughs> All right. All right, you ready? Fucking hey. I'm going to do the whole wing, too. I can't not clean it. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Holy shit, that is so hot. You ready? No. Yes. Okay, I'll have a sip too. All right, for question number nine. John Lennon died the <laughs> same year that you were born. Do you believe in reincarnation? <laughs> yes, I do. I absolutely do. Yeah? I believe in reincarnation, I believe in karma. Okay. I think if you live a shitty life, you come back as something even worse. And uh, what would you like to come back as? A human. Um, I don't know, maybe a tiger. That'd be fun. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think John Lennon came back as? I don't know. He probably would come back as like a walrus or something, right? Oh. <laughs> Cuckoo Kachoo? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't Paul the walrus? You know, I don't know the Beatles that well. Sorry. You're fucking up. Wow. Oh. That's such a, I'm glad you gave me the layup for the bomb. Oh yeah. Yes, I do believe in reincarnation. I think if you're, if you're, 
if you put good out, you get good back. Okay. And that's a lesson I had to learn the hard way. You know, like, for many, many years I put out, looking back on it in retrospect, I think, like, not some, not necessarily negative energy, but energy that was, like, spiteful or felt like I was owed something. And I don't think that's, you know, looking back on it, I'm embarrassed of that. You know, I think being able to be, um, just loving and caring and, and sharing, you know, yeah. and just being, uh, showing empathy and just being, you know, and just showing up, you know, those are those are the qualities that I've learned, I think, in the last, like, five to ten years that have, or maybe more like five years, that have really helped define the, maybe the second half of my life, you know, and I think that's also just comes from being young and fucking dumb and, you know, I think everyone in their, in their early years has a worse attitude than when they get a little more perspective and yeah you know so got me tearing up here it's the sauce it's, it's the sauce <laughs> but you know like yeah you put good out you get good back if you yeah. put good out you hopefully get good in another life you know? hell yeah and, and who knows? if you want to I mean, be a walrus not be real i don't know i'm you know i'm also like would tout atheism generally speaking like i don't know what the fuck is real and what's not and yeah like, so yeah but it's got, a good way to live put the good out there and if it comes back to you then that's great it's hard. It's hard to do that, you know? Like, you can't, it's hard to be good all the time. Yeah. But, like, you know, if it's coming from a good place, coming from, or at least an honest place, then that's the best, the best place. All you need is love. <laughs> it's And it's actually, like, fucking true. Yeah. <laughs> it sounded cheesy when you're 16, but when you're 37, you're like, yeah, man, all you really need is love. Yeah. <laughs> John Lennon, RIP. Um, hopefully you came back as whatever you wanted to be, walrus or... If that was you. Copper Maybe you were the submarine or something. Um, tab of LSD that I ate in the field somewhere. Oh, wow. That would be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I want to take you on this journey with me. Um, all right. We've made it the entire way. Oh, I'm feeling it. I know you are. I'm fucking feeling it. Okay. So, for wing number 10, the reason why we're here, the Storm Chasers Emo Hot Ones Hot Sauce by Soothsayer Sauces in Chicago. Once again, big shout out to Kyle. You may be able to find some remaining bottles on the internet. I'm not we sure. Have three, we have three left right now on the Storm Chaser store. Whenever this airs, that may we not may be have the no case. no left, but <laughs> Soothsayer has some, and we're going to make more. We're going to keep making that, so. Yeah. Holy One shit. of the tastiest and hottest sauces I've ever had. It's the hottest that they make, so um, let's dive in. Number 10, the final wing. You made it. We made it. Oh, oh no. God. God, I'm so fucked up right now. <laughs> <laughs> For question number 10, the final question here, across all your projects, whether it's Intuit Over It or Pet Symmetry, uh, you seem to work off of themes. Uh, you curate a, a feel or a story for your music or your art. Um, what is something that someone has curated that has inspired you? Wow. Something that someone has curated that inspired me. It's intentionally general. Um, I think, you know, and I mentioned this earlier on the, on the episode, but I do think like the 10 club that Pearl Jam does was really, really inspiring. I think something like um, Magnetic Field 69 Love Songs is a really inspiring collection of songs. Um, those are fucking awesome songs. It's a really funny and cool idea, but it also like just created really great material. Yeah. Um, I, I think what's interesting to me about choosing themes with creating art is that it allows you to... Um, Compartmentalize may not be the right word, but it allows you to more easily collect ideas and then be able to execute on them. You mentioned earlier starting fresh, you know, with a, a new record, um, you know, or a new project, and that yeah. kind of helps. Yeah, I mean, it kind of it, it, offer, it offers a little bit of direction, you know. Like with with 52 weeks, the idea was to write and record a song every week. With 12 towns, it was choosing 12 stories about 12 different places and writing songs about them. For proper, it was about. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> With proper, it was about uh, you know designing the very first full-length record and like creating a unified sound on a record. I'd never done that before. Yeah. Um, with the Koji split, it was choosing five neighborhoods in Chicago and writing songs about these five different experiences in these five neighborhoods. With intersections, it was about taking previously existing into it over songs and writing the update to those songs. And then with standards, actually, the original idea for standards was to write a record in standard tuning. And then that failed because I cannot play guitar in standard tuning as well as I can 
I'm not as inspired in standard tuning as I am. Did not know that was behind that name, but that's hilarious. That was the original impetus of the idea. Okay. And, then, and then that kind of shifted into a different idea once we realized like, oh, well, why don't we do a record in a very traditional and in a very traditional way that is also like setting a standard for ourselves. Like there you go. we went to a cabin, we wrote the record for a month then we went to San Francisco and we made a record of tape. And so like, if you have the LP version of that record, that version of that record never saw a computer. I love that. And that is a standard. That was an achievement for me and Josh who made that record together. It was like, we did something that we had never done before in our lives. And that was the, the standard of recording for, you know, decades. Right? Yeah. So when it came to writing figure, that was like one of the first records that I'd done, but like really didn't have a unified direction, but it felt like the songs were all coming from a very unified place. Like uh, this year, that was like a really challenging year for me and being able to write a record about it. And, um, but there's stuff with Pet Symmetry too, you know, like well, or with There, There, There. It's like different ways of writing or different ways of, of especially lyrically, like different ways of writing lyrics. Like with Pet Sim, I can be a little more silly and a little more goofy and kind of embrace the like, sense of humor that I think I had in earlier into it over stuff that I don't have now. Is Pet Symmetry supposed to be funny? <laughs> you guys are joking around the whole time? <laughs> All right. Yeah. But yeah, and then with There, 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 it's a little more conceptual. It's a little more like broad and vague and, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and I can apply that kind of lyrical sensibility, whereas like into it over, it's just very personal. Yeah. Um, it's good to have all those outlets to tap into. Because originally I had all those outlets. Like 52 Weeks was all of that. That right. was the testing ground. And then as projects began to come in and out and evolve, and it became really easy to be able to take facets of my personality that would have made something like Into It Over really confusing if I was applying them all to one project yeah. and be able to like, oh, I can take the sense of humor from Into It Over and then apply that to Pet Sim. And I can take the kind of obtuse, like shreddy thing that I loved to do and really lean into that with There, There, There. Or take like a lot of the like key electronics kind of, you know, and I don't sing in couplet, but like be able to take a lot of the stuff that I would love to do digitally um, or electronically and apply that to like what the couplet songs are. And then really kind of let into it over get defined in its own way. Um, I've already forgotten what the fucking question That's okay. Was. Um, <laughs> that's, that's great. And, and in fact, it, it, that helps us wrap up here very nicely, which is that, um, you know, uh, you started with the progress, but moving into your own project of Intuit Over, it started as something to wear. so broad. There was, no there was no definition. And exactly. so, like, over years, I've been able to really define all of those parts of myself and be able to, because I'm, I'm a complicated person, just like everybody is. Everyone's fucking complicated. So, like, if you can take those intricacies and complications and be able to apply them in different ways where you feel satisfied and complete, that's, that allows me to, at least personally, to feel really whole, you know, and I, and I feel like all the, the, the urges that I would have creatively or, or um, artistically are being satisfied. Yeah, couldn't have said it better. Uh, that said, we are done. You made it, Ugh. you survived, <laughs> somewhat, I think so. I made it, um, So thankfully. You can go ahead and speak to those at home. Um, it's been a busy 2020, uh, an even busier 2021 for you. It's uh, only getting busier. It's only getting busier. <laughs> so um, take a mandated few minutes here and uh, tell everybody at home uh, what is going on for the rest of the year for Into It Over It, Pet Symmetry, There, 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 Couplet, Storm Chasers, everything. <laughs> So with Intuit Over It, uh, Figure came out in September. We never got to tour on that record, so we're eventually going to get to tour on that record this year. Um, also, the instrumentals are coming out, which uh, are coming out right around the same time as this episode. If you would like to get the instrumentals version of that LP, you would need to sign up for this Patreon in the limited days that you have left in the month of June, or come see Intuit Over perform, which will be out on tour, uh, me and Joe, as like a solo unplugged performance with Dashboard Confessional in October. Um, we are planning shows for the remainder of the year. Um, Pet Symmetry, stay tuned for 2021. We've got a lot going on, and uh, but first and foremost, we can announce that we're playing at Rye Fest this year. If you're going to be in Chicago, please come to Rye Fest. We hope to see you there. Uh, with There, 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 we are currently working on a record that should hopefully be out in 2022. Um, with Couplet, stay tuned for 20, 2021. Um, and hopefully some, I mean, all of these bands will be performing in 2022, but the big story has been Storm Chasers, which we've been allowed to, uh, afforded the opportunity just through our creative collaboration and creating all sorts of different content, being able to release vinyl records every single month for all different bands and, and varieties of colleagues and companions and people who are involved and um, be able to do stuff like this where we're, you know, which, and as we move into 
next year be able to take concepts like Emo Hot Ones and be able to you know bring in bands from out of town that are on cycle and be able to promote them as well so we're not just you know only promoting ourselves we I think we want to ultimately turn this into a platform in which we can lift the entire scene and community so Absolutely. Um, if you're here we're psyched that you're here and if you're not here we hope that you join um, we're releasing content every single day pretty much and uh, have new we're giving back as much as we possibly can so whether that's through records or through hot sauce or through whatever else <laughs> awesome well um, I don't know if I'm puffy here. I rubbed my eye about 15 minutes ago, <laughs> and I've been trying and to like, hold it together. I was really like, uh, uh, yeah. it I'm, hurts. I'm proud uh, of you. I'm, I'm just having a fucking nuclear meltdown over yeah, here. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> well, uh, just wanted to say thank you again for everybody at home for tuning in. I uh, hope you learned a little bit about Evan, about Storm Chasers, <laughs> um, and that you had a great time. Uh, we definitely did, at least partially. Uh, so uh, once again, thanks to 2112 Chicago for hosting us in this amazing facility using this amazing equipment. Uh, thanks to Eric, Maj, and Adam Beck for everything behind the scenes. Uh, and uh, thanks to Soothsayer once again for our own personal hot sauce. But most importantly, thanks to you for tuning in. We are very, very excited to, uh, to be on episode two and to have many more down the pipeline. So yeah. thank you once again, uh, Storm Chasers. Until episode three, we will see you soon. Up top. <laughs> Somebody opened the door and I went like this. <laughs>